Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Sietse Kaalsvaart from TNO in the Netherlands. And today we'll have a session on big data, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, and deep learning. <clears throat> and I'll give you a little bit of framework in the beginning. Um, this, uh, we, most of us don't see as a car anymore, at, at least with the views we have today. And actually, in that time, we couldn't imagine the cars we have today. So if we go to 2040, <coughs> maybe it looks like this. Maybe it looks completely different. We don't know. It's going to be really hard for us to imagine what, how we will view a car in 2040. So in this session, um, we, we have several topics. Um, one is big data just saying that actually we should see our vehicles as a source of data, not just this beautiful piece of engineering, but also just a source of data. The next one is artificial intelligence. It means that our vehicles are become learning devices. Um, you can train them. Um, it's a completely wa different way of, of looking at vehicles, at cars. Then deep learning. <coughs> layered learning, um, hierarchical levels of learning. So it's uh, yet another um, layer and another way of looking at our vehicles. And to make things complete, internet, internet of Things is making this even more complicated because now all at once our car is just a node in the network and may not even be the central node in the network. It's just one of these nodes. So it changes the perspective on the vehicle a lot. Um, now these speakers will, will, will address this um, um, uh, all in their own way and I'll introduce him to them to you in a minute. Um, there's one thing to, to add to this is that you can actually address this on, on various levels. Um, so using big data, using AI, um, a lot of the work today is on perception and how does a vehicle perceive its environment. But it can also be on the level of scenarios. What does the vehicle do on the road? What do the other road users do? <clears throat> it can be on the level of control, on the level of traffic, or on the level of business. And uh, a lot of AI can, be, AI can be used to, to develop new businesses, to develop new business models. So <clears throat> in setting the stage here, I, I just wanted to, to, to show these levels and, um, as, a, as a starting point. Good, let's go to the overview. <coughs> um, the framework and overview you just saw. Um, our first speaker will be Tom Luders here in the middle, um, Director of Testing Solutions at uh, Hello, Hella Aglaya. Um, the second speaker will be Peter Kolpaert, um, Chief Technology of Smart Flanders, and uh, also an IMEC in the Department of Electronics and Information Systems. And our last speaker will be from NEC, um, Roberto Baldessari, um, Deputy General Manager at Nex Labs Europe. So um, I give the floor to Tom Luders and um, give him a, a big hand. Yeah. So good afternoon. So my name is Tom Lüders. I'm working for Heller Aglaya, which is a 100% subsidiary of the Heller. Heller, you know probably from the headlamps in your vehicle. Um, we are 250 people located in Berlin and are focusing on perception and validation of the environment perception. And that's because it's a breakout session. I would like to tell you something about my daily life in validation of the um, perception of the today's vehicles and have a look in the future as well at the end. So, which button to press now? This one. So you probably, I arrived in the morning in Brussels today, so it was completely foggy, nothing to see. Um, even the pilot, it was a lady, was flying completely computer steered. Uh, the last miles uh, to, to land safely and that needs to get validated because perception is somebody, sometimes uh, 
difficult. Yeah, so you can see in the, on this picture what a human can see, what a machine can see. Probably this is typically perception from a vehicle on the topmost picture. So what is the, the role of the tier one or the tier in the automotive industries is we supply the automotive industries with control units, with devices, with technical devices, with subsystems and with software. Um, typically, we are responsible for the design and also for the validation of all those systems. And the customers, they give us requirements, what they want to have, uh, depending on the security or safety or technical level they want to achieve. So and today we are facing uh, requirements from the OEMs, starting from you have to validate your radar or your front camera driving 250,000 kilometers up to certain million kilometers just to bring the statistic evidence that the system is the same very safe or secure working as the human is driving. Yeah, so that's what we heard in the sessions in the, in the morning already. So we are responsible for subsystem validation. So what you can see here, it's a little bit stretched. It's a typical testing vehicle we're using for environment perception. You can see on the top, there's a laser scanner on also some there on the bumpers, there's uh, additional laser scanners, as well as a, a certain amount of front cameras uh, on the windshield, you cannot see over here. That's what we're using to collect data in the field and to use the reference systems to compare what they see with what the assistance system or the test, uh, the test object should have seen. So that's just the overview, how we work. Typically, there's a lot of sensors uh, around the car, even more in the future. There's a lot of radars uh, surrounding the vehicle, as well as laser scanners, cameras, and then we're also collecting all the data from the vehicle itself. This means ego motion data, or something the, the driver is doing, like braking, setting the... Uh, uh, yeah, putting on some, some light or we identify also what is the rain light sensor is telling us about if it's dark or is it raining. So what are then the challenges? So we have, as the test now, we are confronted with a lot of data. Yeah? The data produced by the vehicle, so we have to look at the right data. So we have to correlate different data coming from vehicle buses, like um, engine control signals or camera signals, with the environment data, like point clouds coming from a laser scanner. So then we have to manage all the data. It's a little bit Google. Yeah? So there's data you know what they are, and but you have to all manage them together with the engine and the vehicle data. So then the next challenge, probably uh, Roberto will tell something about, is to verify knowledge. If you talk about learning algorithms versus algorithms which are pre-programmed. So vehicles in the future will learn during their life cycle, so we have to verify this as well. Um, then we have to process the data as the test because we are confronted with too much data. We have to pre-process the data to filter out the relevant data. I will tell you later something about this. And we have to take care also uh, of the privacy protection. There are certain rules that we even are not allowed today to store data in the vehicle if there is not a certain measure to protect the data against misuse. So just a little mass. So I'm, if you cruise through the internet, you can see there's certain numbers uh, going around like certain terabytes per day, up to gigabytes, whatever. And I did a short calculation just by taking one of our testing vehicles. I said, okay, we got two megapixel cameras on it. Uh, front camera, eight megapixel, and uh, some CAN signals from the CAN bus, also flex ray, a little radar, and also some leader. And I summed it up, and uh, hopefully the numbers are right. Um, then you end up with 7.4 terabyte per day 
a recording in one testing vehicle. And it's not the end of the line, so you could also add some additional more reference sensorics and also connect, uh, collect also some internet connection data, whatever you like, and all this IoT stuff from the, from the passenger, and then you are probably double the size. Yeah. So what's the process looking today? There's a nice process graph starting with the data acquisition on the left most uh, corner. So we've got a multi-channel uh, data recorder recording everything which is uh, called data in the vehicle. Starting from the sensors like camera, bus signals, positions, stuff like this, we store this in the vehicle on hard disks and ship this to our data center because it's definitely too much to transfer over the internet today. So then we have also some simulated data because we don't want to drive each scenario. Some of the scenarios are really dangerous, so we think uh, it's sometimes better to simulate them. So also there is a lot of data produced and we also store them in our data center. So then what we also do is we check, um, for example, what I said, uh, weather information coming from the rain light sensor or some behavior of the driver. That is what we also convert into meta information to later find this in the database. Like, please, typical testing scenario, give me all the videos or all the radar signals where my vehicle was 50 kilometers per hour and it was raining and I was in somewhere in, in Brussels. So then we have the human QA finally, which uh, needs to look on all the data manually each frame or maybe certain frames, relevant frames to check um, is that what is the real ground truth we call what has the what is what is the human perceiving as as the environment. So then if you say the data management system is having then testing data, some reference data, simulated data, meta information, also some environmental data coming from the network. QA data coming from the QA people and as well the testing uh, or the test results coming from our SIL software in the loop or HIL hardware in the loop test runs. So this is, uh, we do that using no SQL um, database systems uh, with certain interfaces to correlate all the data without having trouble with too complex uh, data models. What needs to be done is also to fuse that data, to apply some in artificial, uh, artificial, um, artificial intelligence on it because it's definitely too much data to investigate by hand. Um, I will tell you something about this in the next slide. So okay, then what I already said, we process the testing software using the software in the loop and then we do the classical KPI calculation like how much of the traffic signs did my algorithm perceive or not. So this is a typical labeling interface a labeler is looking at. If he do, does the manual QA, he's looking at a web-based system we are using. So you can see there is some pedestrian and some bicycles driving and the typical job is to mark each of those. We do this worldwide just as a teaser and then What's the effort? Uh, that's a very simple uh, mass I did in the plane. So if you have the requirements to validate something 100,000 kilometers, and then we have with an average speed of the testing vehicle from 50 kilometers per hour, roughly 2,000 hours of video material in the stored somewhere in the database. And if you say, okay, what is relevant from all these records? So how many, if you focus, for example, on on pedestrian perception, is it uh, two pedestrians per second, is it five? So depending on the scenario, if I'm in the city or somewhere on the highway, it can be more or less, therefore there is no real number, so you just can multiply now the number of perceptions, it's the 2,000 hours times the seconds, and then you got 7.2 million perceptions times n if it comes to certain perceptions in one second. Then, of course, the sensorics records even more, not one picture per second, it's 22, or on the a, on a leader, 25. Depends on the sensor. And then it even becomes more data. So you have then a lot of frames where there's 
tiny changes and depending on what you have to validate, for example, if your tracker is losing a, a pedestrian in the scene, you have to look at each of the frames. Is the, per the person still visible to the sensor or not? Yeah. Of course, we can simplify this by intelligent uh, scenario definition, but finally it ends up with such big numbers. And, and now, that's the question, what should we do now? We can simulate everything. But this is typical scenario coming from virtual test drive. Um, very good to use for simulation of uh, typical scenarios to validate the vehicle behavior. But if it comes to perception, does this look like a real world scene? Uh, can I use it for radar simulation or can I use it for leader simulation? Okay, this is a camera simulation module, but it is not, it's far from reality. I could much effort into making it Hollywood style more realistic, but it's, it's still not the truth. And as the testing team, we are forced to test against the truth or against the reality, not against the simulation. So simulation can be every time a good part of it, but not a solution. Finally, for example, this is a typical radar perception. What does it tell us? Yeah. So we have to understand what the data are saying, so to be classification of some uh, obstacles in the, in the past. So then the solution for the moment is that the camera picture, for example, compared with the radar picture or radar image, is um, checked by human on a daily basis. Yeah. So in this case, we did apply already some uh, learning or AI approach so all these pedestrians were perceived by a neuronal network and proposed to the labeler so that he just has to check, okay, this is correct, this is correct, and the others are probably not correct, and then erase them from the scene. So another approach is to combine, doing some kind of sensor fusion also for the test, to combine leader and neuronal information to classify a scene. You can see there's all those red dots on the upper image is reflections coming from the leader sensor and the lower image is the classification, semantic classification by a neuronal network and if you combine both you have a 3D semantic classification and can use this as a proposal to the human to do the final QA. Another scene, just a crossing on a street so, what now? Well, which topics we are working on for the moment to improve our validation and to speed up our work is, of course, yeah, we've, our main goal is to validate the um, autonomous vehicles. Yeah. We will further build on uh, fusion also for testing. Yeah, that's reference uh, fusion called this. We will uh, continue on critical scenario definition, whatever critical means. There's a certain amount of European uh, projects ongoing. We are participating, for example, in Enable S3, which is dealing with uh, critical scenarios for um, efficient um, validation of uh, driver assistance systems. And we also will continue to improve our pre-processing for testing like uh, compression of data. We call this, or for example, triggered recording that you just record data in the vehicle if they are uh, relevant or not. And also, yeah, to continue on uh, uh, developing the simulation capabilities. So, then some question for you. What topics need to be addressed, solved in the short term? And we can discuss probably later. So that's my question to you. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you, Tom Luders. Um, any questions from the audience uh, to Tom Luders? Luders. <coughs> no? We'll have more time for discussion uh, at the end. Um, so Tom, you, you, you gave an example of um, having to drive 100,000 kilometers for testing. Um, how do you deal with the repetitiveness in such a drive? 
because there will be a lot of repetition of the same kind of events. Exactly. So typically we record the data and uh, then we replay them in-house by just reusing the data. Mm -hmm. But if you, as you know, there's no situation like the other, uh, typically. For example, if you validate some assistant system, like some, some sensor in one vehicle, it's completely different behaving in another vehicle. Uh, so you cannot, for example, reuse all the stuff for different uh, automotive companies or for different models. That's a challenge, for example, as well. So you have today, at least uh, on a certain level, to repeat some of the stuff, of course. So to, to learn about the behavior of, of a new system or an, an upgrade of that system, you, you have to redo it anyway. Exactly. And anyway, Sensorix is uh, improving on a, on a yearly or two yearly base. So for the moment, we are increasing the, the resolution of the front cameras. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the radar development is continuing. Then the leader systems are arriving yeah. on a, in a hardened base. So there's every program, let's call it like this, every vehicle program, another challenge um, to, uh, to cope uh, as validation department, yeah. of okay. course. Thank you. Then our next speaker, Peter Kolpaert, University of Ghent. Thank you very much. Okay, is this uh, working correctly? Yes, does this work? Okay, perfect. I don't hear myself somewhere. Um, good. Uh, can my slides also be, be put on? Or Coming? Okay, perfect. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm a researcher, I'm, I'm from Ghent University, so I like experiments and we have a lot of people, so we have a large audience to do experiments with. And um, I would like to ask you this question, um, how far do you live from work? And I don't want you to shout the answer, but I want you to raise your hand if the units of your answer, of how far do you live from work, was in minutes. Okay, so I would estimate that to be 50% about it. But um, just imagine that, that like, uh, kilometers, that's easy, right? If it would be in kilometers or meters or, or whatever you use, um, then, then, then it would be just a, a map and you have static data, or rather static data, and you would be able to, to just uh, once do an algorithm over that and you would be able to, to, uh, to have that. Now, with minutes, the problem, of course, is that you need to take into account um, uh, the, the public transit schedules, that you need to take into account the, the, the real-time delays, that you need to, to take into account uh, how steep the, the, uh, a certain uh, mountain is if you, if you, if you work uh, on top of the mountain, and so on and so forth. Now, um, uh, okay, this, yes, that one look like, looks like my, my presentation. Okay, good, thanks. Um, okay, so uh, so this is a, a visualization of um, of an isochrone map. So so it's it it uh, it says how far you need uh, or uh, what the time distance is from from one place to another. So I put like the, the middle somewhere in in the city of of Breda, and then you you can see that that using public transport that uh, you have to take 10 minutes, that then the green, uh, the, 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 the green area, and then the blue area is 15 minutes, so, so, so you can go further, and, and then you can even go to the center of Tilburg, but not really to, to, the, to the other slopes, and so on. So this is a really interesting uh, visualization that visualizes the time distance. But of course, this, yeah, the, the data that you need to fetch in order to, to, to be able to, to, to create such a map, if you also want to do this with, with, with vehicles, but because this doesn't yet include vehicles, uh, if a bike, uh, electric bike, automated vehicles, and so on, then we need a lot more, uh, more data. Also, just to... Um, uh, okay. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, also, just to... Um, uh, uh, to, to have data in a an, uh, in an, uh, connected car, you also will need access to, to, to data that, that governments publishes. And, uh, and uh, this, is the, uh, uh, this is what happens when, um, uh, uh, when you need to, to, to uh, share data between two parties. Then probably you're going to, uh, to, to call your government and go, uh, going to say, hey, I'm creating a connected car, uh, connected automated car, and I want um, 
uh, I want access to your uh, to your street system, to your uh, to your speed limits, and so on and so forth. So you will you will call them, you will put put up a meeting, and you will will uh, will uh, uh, you will uh, agree on a protocol. So you will agree on on uh, all kinds of things uh, for uh, which you need to know in order to reuse that kind of data. So um, okay, it was previous. Yes, perfect, it works. Um, and uh, on what levels do we then need to discuss, like uh, this meeting, what will we all discuss? We will discuss the uh, legal parts of our, of our uh, uh, contracts or legal obligations, just like we already uh, uh, saw earlier is that, that sometimes we also may have privacy constraints uh, to, to certain data. But of course, if we are talking about government data, we're talking about open data, data that can be public, such as just an overview of all the streets, um, uh, the, the speed limits in your street and so on. Uh, then, then we hope there are no legal uh, uh, or big legal constraints anymore. We are talking about open data. Then you have the technical uh, uh, constraints. It's, it's how will you move your your data physically on my machine? And uh, and and of course, then 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 we we, we are in, in big luck that that we already have the HTTP protocol or just the web to to do such a things. Then we can talk about syntax, uh, syn uh, syntax. Then we can talk about semantics, and we also need to uh, need to know which questions we can ask over the different systems. So, um, so let's just design an, an, an information system for for uh, for uh, intelligent transport systems, and uh, uh, and and let's design an API. And uh, and if I'm a, uh, if I'm a government uh, institute. I can, for instance, create an API like this. For instance, I'm the, the public transport company of, of Flanders, or maybe I'm the public transport, uh, or, or maybe a, a tax, taxi company, or maybe I'm a car sharing company. Well, then I need uh, something like this, right? I need, I need something where you ask uh, two questions, um, or, you, uh, or two, uh, two parameters. You enter uh, a from, and you enter uh, a to. No, of course, uh, it's it's really hard to guess what what uh, what exactly people will want as an answer on this uh, on this this response. Because, for instance, uh, maybe you want wheelchair accessible routes, or maybe you want a quiet car if if it's a car sharing system, uh, or maybe if you're taking public transport, you want to limit the the the, the number of transfers that that you need to do, and so on and so forth. So, um, so what what will uh, what will our system do? We can just keep adding parameters to to our uh, uh, to, to our API. So we can add departure time, a wheelchair accessibility parameter. We can add uh, maximum transfers and so on and so forth. But we will need to keep adding adding uh, uh, these kind of parameters, and and we will need to have we will have to keep adding them, so that in in fact on our on our one system. That, that, that's behind our API, we will have to integrate all data in the whole world because we also will have to, to, to add the planes to that. The, 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 uh, we will have to, to add public transport, all the, all the automated vehicles, all the car sharing systems, the bike sharing systems, and so on and so forth. So in short, transport has become uh, a data problem and uh, we need to fix that. And um, this is the new system in, 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 in which we are, or the new, new situation where we are in, is that a, a government or, or uh, any, uh, any kind of, of, uh, of system within ITS is publishing data, but we don't know anymore exactly who these reusers are. So, uh, so it's infeasible to have all the possible reusers pick up their phone and ask, hey, I want to reuse your database and I want to ask questions over your system. So, and I'm really happy that, that, that this, uh, this conference has an A in it, automated, because in fact also with open data, we want to automate this entire process of instead of picking up your phone and, and, and coming to a process and coming to, to, to a contract in order to, 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 to share data between two parties, we need to automate this, this entire negotiation process until we, have, uh, uh, until we have a good information system. And that boils down, if, if, if a system wants to maximize the, re the reuse of their data, we need to raise the interoperability. And uh, I already, already mentioned it in the, in the beginning, is that uh, the, the first kind of interoperability that we want to raise is the legal interoperability. And for, uh, for open data sets, so governmental uh, data sets, for instance, um, then, uh, yeah, that, then we can add an open license. And today we, we, we can see the, the, the web, right? Uh, this, is, this is not the real size of the web, by the way. Um, 
bad joke, sorry. Um, and then, then there's, uh, in, in, in black area, there's certainly data that we cannot reuse. Then there's this small dot, which, which contains all the open data, which contains openly licensed data. It's, it's, it's free from, or, or, it, it, uh, or there may be a license which says, look, I have copyrights, but I give you, give everyone in the world uh, uh, the, the, the uh, consent to, to, to start reusing this data. And there's no sui generis uh, uh, database, uh, database um, protection on it anymore because we have, uh, uh, for instance, three, these three open licenses uh, on top of that. So, um, so we can keep uh, uh, going through each of these interoperability levels and we can, uh, we can try to uh, raise our interoperability and make sure that this process gets automated. And for the technical interoperability, we have, of course have the internet, we have, we have the web. It is not so evident. I've, 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 uh, uh, still today, people are, are just uh, creating a, a CD-ROM and sending it to people. That's, of course, not a good way to, to automate uh, your, your data sharing. Uh, so, so we want to use the web, we want to use the internet to, to, to share our data. Uh, open syntaxes, that's also not that evident uh, today. We want to use things like HTML, JSON, uh, CSV, and so forth. Um, we also want to raise the semantic interoperability, and this is a difficult one, because, um, because there are a lot of, uh, a lot of standards that, that, that are uh, being, being uh, created, such as the, the Datex standard, which, which you uh, will probably know. Um, but they, 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 they standardize a lot, but also the domain model. That's the, the, the semantics of your data. What, what does a certain word mean? And this is really important, is that, that we also have uh, a consent about the, the, the meaning. But everyone who publishes a data set, for instance, if you have a data set of all the traffic signs in, uh, in, in, in a certain region, then this traffic sign will need an identifier. And if we just use one for this identifier, one, two, three, four, and so on, these identifiers will conflict with all the identifiers used in all other databases that use one, two, three, four, and so on. So we need a global, ident a global way to do identifiers. And this is what, what we solve with linked data. We enable people to create standards with, uh, 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 that, that become semantic semantically interoperable. We, we, um, we allow other people to, to create identifiers which become uh, semantically in, uh, interoperable worldwide. And then the, 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 the final step is to have uh, the querying interoperability. Which questions can we ask? And then, then I come back to, to, to this uh, isochrone map. And then, uh, then, of course, I want to add specific conditions without me having to, to take my phone again and, and, and talk to, to these people that, that, that host such, an, uh, such a service or an API or host their, their, uh, their data. I don't want to ask them, hey, I also want an option for, for criminality or hey, I want also a, a, an option for taking into account all the subscriptions I have. So uh, I want the, the, the web. I want this to be an information system for all this data, which can answer this, uh, uh, these kind of questions in an automated way. And uh, uh, then, then we can uh, discuss about uh, data publishing interfaces. Because on the, on the one hand, we can, we can try to, to, uh, to have smart servers to, 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 to enable everyone to, to answer any kind of question on, on your own server. And we already mentioned that that's, that's problematic because you will have to keep adding functionality to your server. You will have to have all the, the, the knowledge in the world on one machine and that, that will not scale. On the other hand, we can give everyone data dumps. So we can uh, give everyone a data dump of all the traffic signs in a certain area. The problem, of course, is from the moment something changes, the entire data dump will again need to be published, although it gives all the flexibility for everyone. So, so, so you can then answer, indeed, the, these, these kind of questions in which, uh, in which you say, ah, I also want to keep into account uh, criminality statistics and want to take into account the speed limits in, uh, in that street. So, so, uh, so these heterogeneous uh, uh, questions will be able to, uh, to solve. But it takes a lot of effort for, uh, from clients to download this data set each time over and over again each time there's an update and, uh, uh, and yeah, maybe there are of course uh, solutions in the middle where we can just take this large data dump, these gigabytes of data and split them in smaller fragments. If we, do, if we split them in smaller fragments, if we create a hypermedia system over our uh, data, just like the web is also just a, a linked list of, of, of documents, then we can, uh, then we can uh, just download smaller fragments of data and create this global, uh, uh, global um, uh, information system for, uh, for open data concerning mobility. 
Good. And then, uh, then there's this one thing that, that, that I uh, still want to mention, is that uh, uh, with, within Etsy, we are now uh, doing a new, uh, new group, a new standardization, uh, standardization group, the ISG SIM, on context information management. And um, yeah, we, we are just getting, uh, getting started uh, on this, and this is exactly what we want to standardize. We want to standardize the domain models to be used within uh, sensor data, but also smart mobility, smart city, and so on. And uh, yeah, we need further stakeholders to expand uh, this group. So, uh, so if you, uh, uh, if, if this uh, this is appealing to you, please uh, please get in uh, get in touch. Good. So uh, my entire story was was uh, was about uh, was about these data dumps, these these databases that 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 are public data from government paid by taxpayers' uh, money, but also maybe from uh, from private players that want to maximize the reuse of their data. And we want to create this world with, with this data that has already been, been, been paid for by taxpayers' money. We want to create uh, this power where, the, where this knowledge creates power for the many and not the few. Because if you're just going to allow the big players, like the big American players with, with, uh, with large amounts of, 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 of money to create large amounts of centralized systems, like uh, IBM Watson downloads the entire web on their on their own machines to 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 then uh, uh, to to only then uh, solve solve uh, very difficult questions. Then we are not going to create this 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 great world where where everyone can uh, can ask any question over the web. So we need to go to decentralization. We we uh, we need to go uh, in that direction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Peter Kolpaert. Um, any questions from the audience at this moment? Yes, it's quiet. Good. Um, you mentioned that you want to sort of automate, automate, automate the, the negotiation process, so inter interoperability. And then you talk about linked data, and you say the, you want to also standardize or at, at least exchange the semantics, right? <coughs> um, with with linked data, you would you, you could say you can actually find the data, access it, uh, open it, um, and read it, and, and and all that. But will it also in itself tell you the semantics of that? Um, that's uh, the merely the idea of linked data is just to have a, a unique unique uh, global unique uh, uh, identifier yeah. for 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 what you have so so it will have http and so on uh, just like a web address for your for your identifiers so in essence no it will not tell tell you tell you exactly what it what it means because then we still need to standardize the process of of understanding what's what's uh, what what's behind it yeah. But linked data provides the basic building blocks to start building on top of that, because yeah. because without these these identifiers that work globally, mm -hmm. you will not be mm -hmm. able to you will not at all be able to uh, to do to create a system like that. Yeah. So I think linked data is the the necessary constraint to, to 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 go forward. I don't see any other solution to fix the semantic interoperability. Yeah. Okay. So it's <coughs> it's the basis, but it's not enough yet. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. In indeed. <coughs> so now I have the situation in a company like, like ours where we, we have a data set and it's described and somebody did some nice documentation. Um, and the next time I, I do a, a, a test setup, a test run, the configuration of my vehicle is just a little bit different. And actually that same sensor signal with that name now means something else. Do you, do you have an answer to that? I see Tom uh, nodding as well. So this this is really on on even within a company where there is not uh, a big of a de debate on the meaning of of uh, data sets or the individual fields, there still is a, there are situations where there's confusion about yeah, what 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 it means. Well, I, I know even a more more uh, even a even a more simplistic uh, example yeah. is that is that me myself when I create a data set. Yeah. Even one year later, I'm I'm so confused about what I did one year uh, one year ago. Yeah. So uh, so URIs or or linked data will allow you to to document your your data in its in its essence. Mm -hmm. So even if you have like three statements, three basic statements, yeah. it allows you to, to to document it by 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 using web addresses. You will always be able to to resolve these 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 HTTP identifiers yeah. and then see the documentation of of, of that exact term. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it it creates it creates a, a yeah 
an, an automated way to, 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 to get the, the, the documentation, to create yeah. this, this okay. uniform interface yeah. of your yeah. information okay. system. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Tom, you want to comment on that? Or? <laughs> Just get the draw. Yeah, okay. Um, good. Let's go to our next uh, speaker, Roberto Baldessari. Right to zoom forward. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Roberto Baldessari. I work for NEC Labs Europe. And uh, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, IoT, uh, deep learning, and big data, this uh, <laughs> apparently buzzwords, but actually there's more to it than just buzzwords. And uh, first, let me just allow uh, to say something about who we are, and then I will talk about some trends in deep learning, in particular, how we classify at a high level deep learning for autonomous driving. Then I want to talk about um, one specific uh, application of big data and uh, deep learning, how we can actually use the cloud to assist autonomous vehicles. And then I also want to talk about Autopilot, which is a, a very large project on IoT for autonomous driving. So as I mentioned, uh, I work for NEC. NEC is a large Japanese company. We are a horizontal ICT vendor. Uh, so we provide hardware and software. I would say, most of all, we are a big data company for the social infrastructure. Uh, we have long history, of course, long history of innovation. We have five R&D labs, and I belong to the European R&D labs located in Heidelberg, Germany. We have been there for more than 20 years. So our transportation business includes uh, public transport solutions, traffic management, automotive, computer vision, deep learning, and logistics. So I would say we are present in all key components of autonomous driving, even though we don't make cars. So uh, recently, we classified our technology. So we are a large ICT vendor. We have a lot of technology. So from time to time, we have to regroup them. Uh, this also helps us understand the, the key trends. So And we group them in six categories. And what I find interesting is that these are key uh, building blocks of autonomous vehicles. So in autonomous vehicles, you need a good platform. You need a fast computing platform. You need networking, 5G or ITS G5. You need good security. And then you need data science, basically. Here, what we call visualization is, is a bad translation from Japanese. Actually, it's recognition. You need recognition. What do you do with that? Once you have recognized the data, you have to analyze that. You have to predict. That's uh, uh, analysis. And then control guidance is actually the decision support or automatic decision making technology. We call all of this NEC the wise. Now let me talk about deep learning. So I'll raise some eyebrows now if I say that object recognition is a solved problem. I mean from from an academic perspective, from a scientific perspective, deep learning has already shown to be unbeatable. It actually it beats the, the human eye beats the human recognition. Of course, uh, there are engineering challenges to take this technology to the road. But what I want to say is that from a perspective of the need for developing new technology, actually there's no need to develop new technology in the, in the recognition of obstacles and objects. Deep learning is already there. Uh, actually, it was already proven in 2011 that it outperforms the human eye. Now, what we consider to be hot, a hot application in uh, uh, autonomous driving is the next step, which is the scene recognition. The idea here is that uh, we train uh, the convolutional uh, neural networks on a kind of a code book of situations, so all possible driving scenarios, ideally, and we map what we see currently to the best uh, matching reference scene. So imagine 
if you have unlimited computing power and you have all this kind of code book and it's complete, now there are some assumptions here, but imagine that you can basically come up with a hash table and you embed it into your vehicle. And then every time you recognize a scene, what you can do, you can use that uh, prediction as an additional input and you can use it to extend the prediction horizon of rule-based approaches. So rule-based approaches are model-based approaches. So uh, this is what the, the automotive industry is very strong at, at modeling the behavior of other vehicles on the highway, for example. But that doesn't scale well. You can predict up to two seconds, maybe, you know, but you know, doing all the computation in real time beyond two seconds is not possible. That's why we are working on deep learning on this so that we can extend the uh, uh, prediction horizon and we could use it either for autonomous drive, we could also use it for ADAS basically uh, because we could, for example, raise a warning message saying, okay, it has to be also filtered by some kind of decision logic, but the idea is given the current circumstances, it's very likely that a car in front of you that you maybe can't even see will cut into your lane. So this is a kind of application. And now there are some, uh, th there's another group of approach, approaches, and this is very interesting, it's not from us, uh, but uh, this is done by NVIDIA, and it's interesting that they're next door to uh, the NEC Labs, uh, America Lab in, um, uh, in Princeton. So these people next door, they're working on end-to-end -end learning. End-to-end -end learning means you get rid of semantic abstraction, you get rid of path planning as we know it, and control theory, you throw it out, you just plug deep learning between your perception input, the cameras, and the drive-by-wire system. And you just train the uh, 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 convolutional networks with some simulators, for example. Obviously, this is an extreme approach. We are not particularly supporting their approach yet, but I think that it's very interesting to look at, at these trends because it's not that unlikely that one day they'll be able to train a vehicle just in this way. So we should reflect on this kind of approaches. Now, <clears throat> this is um, more in the control area. If we have a reasonably power computing infrastructure in the cloud or in the edge, I would say. Uh, recent technology enables us to run all the control uh, functions, for example, motion planning that so far has been only a technology, so a, a step, a, a component running on board. We could run it actually in the infrastructure. Recently, there have been progress, we have also been working on this, in uh, uh, scalable space search motion planning uh, algorithms, for example, extending the RRT family, you know, Newtonomy, for example, the startup in Singapore running autonomous taxis, they also use an RRT family-like algorithm developed by MIT. We also are working on that, but here the point is, we can make motion planning, discrete motion planning, very scalable, and we can control a lot of vehicles from the infrastructure. And since we have standardized V2X in Europe, we have ITSG5, so very low latency, and we have cameras, for example, we can think of a scenario where we have an automated valet parking use case, where you drop your car at the mall, and the car drives itself, or better, is driven by the infrastructure to an assigned uh, uh, parking spot. And then when you pay at the cash register, the car is driven back to where you are. So this is a, a kind of, um, out yes, it's automated, but with the uh, assistance from the infrastructure. And this is also where IoT plays a role. And since we're talking about IoT, I would like to introduce this, um, European project called Aut Autopilot. We're proud of being a member of this project. It's a large project with uh, 44 members and it was uh, uh, kicked off in uh, uh, February at the event. The project started officially on 1st of January. And it's a project that is uh, quite ambitious. Uh, the idea is here 
well, first of all, it's a pilot, it's not a research project, so forget about what I said before of the end-to-end -end learning. Here we want to pilot existing technology, but the value here is in linking information coming from different sources, in uh, defining interfaces, probably reusing, uh, maximizing the usage of existing standards, and I'll come to that in a moment and also use advanced communication technology. So this is roughly the architecture. We have a, an IoT cloud that also actually um, consists also of an IoT edge. We have the vehicle system, which is an IoT system in itself, because you have an IoT gateway, you have sensors and so on. And then we have a whole IoT ecosystem, which is, for example, enabled by IoT standards. Now, I use the word IoT, 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 we hear it a lot, right? So I'll tell you what is IoT for us. IoT is actually a stack for us, and this is the emerging stack coming from several IoT projects, smart city projects, uh, standardization, uh, industry alliances. The idea is that you have the sensors, you have some low-level standards created by 1M2M, which already enable some semantic representation. And you have the uh, brokering and discovering functions on top of that, which can link multiple IoT clouds, and which allow then a processing at the level of semantic in a way that abstracts the details of the underlying devices. This is IoT in an essence for us. Obviously, it has to scale well, has to perform well, and so on. So we have been doing IoT now for many years, um, and uh, we also uh, help define these protocols. And we are also chairing the um, Etsy ISG CIM that was mentioned before by Peter. We are bringing these features into autonomous driving in the autopilot. Uh, for example, in order to be able um, to link different uh, existing clouds through a, a brokering mechanism, I mentioned the use case before uh, of the uh, automated valet parking. So there has to be a step where the control of the vehicle is handed over to, for example, a parking lot controller. That has to be done by an IoT cloud. There's an IoT local cloud with the sensors, and there's an IoT gateway, and there's a controller. And that's just one use case, but there are multiple use cases. Imagine, for example, we have problems, or better, we have opportunities in doing cloud edge orchestration. So which features should be kept in the cloud, which should be pushed to the edge where you have lower latency? So that depends, uh, for example, on the requirement. But the key here is to implement some orchestration mechanism such that these things can be done dynamic, dynamically. Right, so there's a, an IoT ecosystem out there. I just want to say something that it's an opportunity. For example, many cities already are joining the Open and Agile Smart Cities uh, consortia, and they're already applying this stack with maybe some local adaptations. Yes, Autopilot, I mentioned before, there are uh, 44 partners, so it's a very big project. Uh, it's very interesting that we have uh, multiple dimensions here. We have basically the ICT, so the IoT vendors uh, working together with the automotive uh, companies and automotive research centers. This is a uh, uh, very, very interesting. And we have several uh, pilots. Actually, instead of talking about the individual pi pilot and, and test sites, I would like to invite you to join the uh, demonstration that will happen at the social event tonight, uh, 6 p.m., uh, 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 co-located with the, uh, the, the social event. So at 6 p.m., you, you will be able to see a demonstration of basically the starting point of Autopilot. Remember, Autopilot just started three months ago. Yes, um, I would like to conclude uh, my presentation with just some challenges, some input for, for discussion. One challenge we see is the lack of uh, 
open reference repositories. So I talked before about deep learning, about this code book concept. Well, the problem is that there are no, there's no reference uh, repository, there's no reference benchmark for uh, these kind of systems. I mean, there are, there are a few open uh, data sets, but most of all companies, especially in the US, are buying a lot of data sets coming from private companies. And I think that the issue here is that we're not converging towards some kind of a standardized testing or, or quality procedure. Uh, since I'm talking about testing, uh, again, a question from me to you, it would be, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on testing, of course, and ADAS, um, um, you know, there are companies specialized on testing that we also have represented here, but does testing the way it is done today really scale well? Does it really scale for autonomous driving? Can we really apply the same procedures that we apply for ADAS? Can we apply them for autonomous driving? Honestly, I have some doubts because the complexity, the number of scenarios involved is much bigger. And what about just shifting the emphasis from testing to training? Maybe if we define some standards for training uh, the learning uh, algorithms, we could probably make the whole development more efficient and it will scale better. Now, security. Um, autopilot and many projects uh, are using a kind of a off-the-shelf security technology um, approach. We have authentication, integrity, encryption, of course. That's everything there. But don't we need something more than that for autonomous driving? I mean, even if you have a, so a piece of data that is coming from another vehicle, if we have an IoT extended uh, autonomous driving, we have a piece of data coming from another vehicle, the data is authenticated, uh, it's, uh, we have verified integrity, so nobody has manipulated the data, but is it still data we want to rely on? So we're working a lot on um, blockchain, for example, for the financial sector. Blockchain is about distributed consensus, and uh, why not? We could also investigate blockchain for autonomous vehicles, meaning if 60% of the vehicles around you agree on something, there's, there's a higher likelihood that that is true than if maybe 30%. Just it's a very, very you know, basic, very high level statement. But this is what the financial industry is looking at. And uh, some non-technical issues. I think that we immediately hear when there's an accident caused by autonomous vehicle, even if it, the autonomous vehicle did not cause the accident, but we don't hear when an accident was avoided thanks to autonomous driving. So maybe there's also something we should do to improve, to make it fairer. I think currently it's a little bit unfair how you know, immediately these accidents are reported, but maybe we, we should speak up more about the accidents that we can prevent. One thing I have to say about Europe is that I see as a kind of a lack of venture capital. I mean, I've been doing a lot of European projects for the uh, uh, past 15 years. Uh, it is true that sometimes innovation in the US outpaces innovation in Europe, and we have to reflect a bit about that. And uh, since uh, I want to also talk about this, uh, we have, I've been working on cooperative systems, and cooperative systems are part of uh, autonomous driving, I just want to avoid making some mistakes as a community in betting too quickly on certain things. And, and we should take from, we should take into account from day one the business model or the lack of a business model if there is such a problem. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Roberto. Um, so um, you mentioned this this um, concept of the, the code book and hash tables. So can you explain a bit more what what's in the code book? The code book would be 
a very big set of driving scenarios okay. with sensor data and images. Now, mm -hmm. if we're talking about computer vision, the images, what matters, you can use other inputs for mm -hmm. the ground truth. Mm -hmm. The problem is that it has to have statistical relevance. Mm -hmm. So it has to include a very big number of scenarios. But I think that we're getting there because there's a huge acceleration of activities, especially in the US. Mm -hmm. There are a few um, companies that have, well, there are a few universities that have started creating some open data sets, but there are companies selling data sets. Um, I think we're getting there. What I fear is that we're getting there in a very kind of decentralized, uncontrolled yeah. way, but that has to do also with the business forces behind that. And maybe to a certain extent, we should also accept that because otherwise, you know, <laughs> we, go, we go back to the last point I made. So things have to be driven by uh, potential for revenue making, yeah, right? For market so forces. I totally understand yeah, that. Yeah. So Tim, Tom, if you would have a code book like that, would you want to use it? Um, do we have to switch? Hello. Of course, yes, as, as the typical test, I have to test against this code book. <laughs> yeah. I'm not thinking. Typically, you measure. You, it's like like a yeah, like a linear. You measure against. You compare one with the other. That's test today. Yeah. And that's what yeah. you also okay. say. Is the test method we are also we are living today still uh, suitable? And just an example, we do a lot of uh, image algorithm stuff. For example, one thing is kind of, is called image registration. Mm -hmm. So you perceive a certain image from the environment and you store a kind of hash key from how the scene looks like. Yeah. So then you drive the next day, some cars are parked completely different uh, mm -hmm. or the season changed, no leaves on the trees. Mm -hmm. The hash key is completely different. So, yeah. But it's the same position and the same more or less scenario. Yeah. Uh, so how to deal with that? Uh, so that's what you said. The, the amount of data is quite huge to cover all the... But I guess I, I think we can can um, cope that in the future. That's just a question of of uh, how to uh, operate with the data because there was a comparison in the newspaper since years ago, so that we know more than people lived hundred years ago just by reading one year the New York Times. Yeah. yeah so th that's just a question of time that we can accumulate yeah. a lot of knowledge. Uh, and then to process it. But yeah. for the test, for the moment, it's a huge effort to yeah. validate, okay. definitely. Good. So filling, filling the code book, that's the, the assignment for the next years, right? Yeah. That's one thing, yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then you also mentioned the vehicle may actually recognize those situations. Is that what you said, Roberto? The objective is to recognize a dangerous situation. So the dangerous scene recognition. The idea, as I said, is that there are some driving scenes that are apparently not dangerous. But if we have this code book, we can predict that there is a danger just based on the you know, statistical relevance of that event mm -hmm. based on the current circumstances. Yeah. So. Basically, the relative positions of vehicles on, on the highway, the speed, so all the circumstances. And that is not possible through model-based or rule-based prediction of other vehicles' behavior. It simply, it simply doesn't scale. Yeah. And uh, you, that, that's where machine learning makes the difference, yeah. right? So again, I, I mentioned before that the, the, this prediction I believe should be, at least for the short to midterm, it should be an input to the decision model that is still you know, designed by an automotive company based on their own expertise mm -hmm. uh, of traffic and how to control a vehicle. So I, we were not saying we should <laughs> replace the rule-based approach and the model-based approach. But if you have multiple inputs, you can probably make a better decision. 
Thank you. Any questions from the audience to Roberto Baldessari or any of the other speakers? Yes, there's a question here. Yes, a question to Roberto, please, about testing. You said that testing becomes a huge burden, and then you explained that it, it is a highly complex exercise. If you can el elaborate a bit more, I mean, highly complex number of use cases, for example, or uh, when we are discussing about cross-border, then maybe there are legislative issues. I mean, where do you focus uh, uh, the complexity, or if it is a combination of all these things? And the second part, what would you advise uh, uh, the stakeholders that can intervene in the process, say, for example, the Commission to do in this case. Can we do something to facilitate more this testing exercise? Thank you. It's uh, a very good question. Thank you. Um, we're not a testing company. I have to make that premise. We just observed that the amount of effort uh, does not scale well. I mean, an autonomous uh, driving car, theoretically, should be tested in every driving circumstance, in every driving situation. Now, I don't know any testing center that is capable of doing that. Typically, a testing center would test ADAS, for example, by you know, simulating an accident with a dummy. They might simulate an intersection. They might have uh, some kind of a ring. Uh, there are a few driving scenarios that they can test. Still, they, they do an excellent job. That's why we have a leadership us in Europe in ADA. So great. But I have the feeling that we're never going to be able to create a test center that can test every driving circumstance, every driving scenario. So where? we can get, I don't know. I, is it 30, is it 50, is it 80%? I don't know. But I'm saying that probably we have to think out of the box and maybe we can try to standardize some steps before the testing. For example, the benchmarking at the training phase. So, I, because this is where we're focusing as a company and that's where the, you know, the data is being collected currently. Maybe that's also where uh, some pre-testing, uh, qualification, certification type of uh, program should look at. Thank you. Um, we have a, um, a couple more questions prepared, and uh, some of them actually involve some audience uh, participation. The first question for us through the forum, what should we not expect from big data, AI, and deep learning? So where are the boundaries? There is a lot of expectations nowadays. Is it going to, to run our car completely? Or is it, um, is, if shouldn't we not expect, should we not expect that? Where are the limitations you see to, to all the big expectations there are now? So. <laughs> Question to you, Peter. Yeah, as, as a first remark, I would I would like to say that that a lot of people I speak to don't just don't look far enough. Like like so, I would like to, to reverse the the, yeah. the the question a bit and say like, it's 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 great what we're all, all going to to be able to do with, yeah. with big data. So so we can be 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 quite pretentious about this and and say that it's going to to solve a lot of issues. But what it's not going to solve is, is it's not going to change the mindset of, of, of all people immediately. Mm -hmm. that's, that's something we will, we will have to keep doing to, to, uh, uh, to, to, to tell them to... It, it's still people who, who, who create yeah. the data sets themselves. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so without the data being, being available, without the data being manageable, this, this revolution is not going to happen at yeah. all. Uh, not big data, not AI, not... Uh, so, so do you say people should open up more on, on sharing data? Is, is that one element? Uh, yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah. But, but also, okay. So the mindset of the people is not going to change or going to change very slowly, even if you have all this nice technology around and uh, are working very hard on it. Yeah, it's uh, still the still the processes itself where where people right now create the data is, are lacking behind on 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 what deep learning and, and big data can can do today. Yeah. Okay. Any other responses? Yes. Okay. 
Then on validation of AI and deep learning, I think we touched on this a lot, uh, yeah. also in the question that was raised just now. So just um, skip that one. No, that's okay. That's a good question. Hmm? That's a good question. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> I give it to you. I, in, the, in the morning we had this discussion, when it's good enough, um, compared to what we train the networks today is we train the, the, the networks with data we know already. So the environment is as we created the environment, but the completely automatic environment will be completely different from today. Yeah, so there is a continuous training ongoing, so there will be never enough, of course. Uh, that's the answer to it. Okay, so it never yeah. stops. It so never it, stops. it becomes a continuous process. Exactly. So would you say we still have like um, type approvals and uh, separate releases or would make that a continuous thing as well? Exactly. One idea could be to have kind of mass data collection. All the vehicles collect data f and store it in a, as you say, centralized network and then to learn from it yeah. and to update this codebook, of course, and then to update the software of the vehicles to get into the next uh, validation phase. Yeah. Okay, here we come to Peter, because does this scale? If we massively monitor all these vehicles, and then wha what do we do with the data? Because is this going to be central storage, or is that going to be in some other way? Yeah, uh, I, I believe everything that, that we're doing today, we should keep doing. That, that, that's, that's already one, one thing. I don't want you to stop your, your jobs in, 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 in any case. But um, uh, it's, it's only, we will only reach this, this scale if we, if we start to decentralize. And today all these technologies, the, the, the first reflection uh, or the first uh, reflex that, that, that we have is to create a centralized data store with a closed world assumption. Yeah. Which means like a closed world assumption means my machine knows everything about the world and all the algorithms that I'm going to put on top of this, this machine, it's going to pretend that, like that's the world. Yeah. And we need to adopt an open world assumption where, where, yeah. where we can say like, okay, this is an answer, but there may be more answers outside of my own machine and we will, we will, we will be able to crawl the web in order to find uh, yeah. more answers. Okay, so this is in line, Tom, I think, with what you say, it will never end because there will be new situations, there will be new perceptions, mm -hmm. so we... Exactly, but there's no problem typically. So we have um, situations where the vehicle is used to be yeah, and uh, no, feels itself safe and there will be situations where the vehicle will feel unsafe yeah. and ask probably for support yeah. or do something safe and uh, that's of course that's that's we f like we behave as, as as human as well yeah, yeah. yeah. okay thanks um, there is a question in the back there thank you mr chairman good evening citizens um, uh, first of all uh, the 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 AC ICG SIM standard group is welcomed. We have one of the best in the world standard uh, groups, and I hope we'll keep it. Uh, but uh, all the international communities, they are speaking about the Internet of Everything right now. That means a cooperation between humans and machines, machine to machine, human to human, because human also is a thing in a way. So here we are speaking in the first European uh, level without the European SMEs which they are doing a tremendous work right now uh, between the communication of machine to machine. We have the, the protocols, the, the SIGFOX protocol, which was paid by the citizens and the, by the French company. And now we are exporting also to USA. And the LoRa, uh, which is uh, developed by the Germans. Uh, and these protocols, they are developing a, a new internet, kind of internet, for the communication of the internet of everything. We don't discuss this for, this, for uh, these things. We are discussing for things which are three, four years back of the progressive technological communities of the world. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, any responses to this? <coughs> I think it, I would have to talk offline to understand the, the scope of the question. Um, it depends on what meaning you assign to the word IoT. So the IoT European project, so the European research community on IoT has been focusing on creating a stack uh, that allows to have, well, first of all, a sort of standardized architecture of what is an IoT gateway, 
uh, what is an IoT broker, what should be the APIs towards the application developers. And uh, there, there, there are, the results are, for example, the reference architecture of the um, AI, IoT I, <laughs> and also the IoT A project uh, reference architecture, and they're now uh, being brought into the Etsy standardization. So this is the result of the European uh, research community on IoT. And uh, there have already been some successful applications. As I said, the uh, 100, roughly 100 cities are already opening up APIs based on the specifications coming from these European projects. So I consider this as a success, and uh, still, it's kind of a first step, we can say, of um, uh, IoT deployment. But you know, if this is what we mean by IoT, I think it's working. So some cities are recognizing the value, and they're opening up the APIs, and this will, again, open uh, the field for many other startups that you know, will use the data uh, uh, feed from these APIs. where we are with IoT, I would say. I want to thank the speakers for the contributions, for their presentations, and we, we, we close this session. So can I have a big hand for these speakers?
is, yes, there is no break. So it's going to be now ah, the latest. Yeah. 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 So what, what do we do here? So what is that? So it means we are not going to take our stuff with us. Why? I wanted to bring the post to the next one and the world bring it again back. Because they have only one. Oh no, no, they have only one as far as I can see. Pointing. I think it's like a walking distance. For me, it's not a problem. I can bring it and nobody is going to do it. So if they have some material, flyers and stuff, I don't know if you have to do it. No, everything is on the box. First time we have less material. No, for me was like they said. I think I have to check the emails and they said that they are going to bring something with them. Do they have something? But Sarah asked them. They said okay, you need to bring the poster. It's perfectly going to be close. I think that we have to. To take the poster with us yeah, today and then we need to come on. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Yes, whoopee. Good afternoon. Um, this room is very packed. If you can't fit in, shh, shh, shh. If you can't fit in, do not sit on somebody's head. Not a good idea. Go downstairs to level zero to the comfort of the listening rooms, okay? So if this just all feels a bit much, a bit sweaty, a bit close, uh, go downstairs. Take the escalators and you can listen in, okay? In fact, some of you will have to because there won't be quite enough room for everybody. Oh, your star, thank you. Okay. Hello. Oh, who are you? I can, who are you? I can't see you. Up. Ah, marvellous. You're here. Okay. I wait for a signal to start. We're actually ahead of time. By three minutes. Oh, my God. It is incredible. Did you have a productive time? Good sessions? Yes. yes? Who ate more than one eclair? Qui a mangé plus d'un eclair during lunch? I do not, I simply do. Who, okay, who ate more than one dessert? I just think you're not confessing. There's always somebody, there's always a few people, for sure. An interesting thing happened to me when I was briefly outside. There was the quote, there was the statistic from Dr. Carlo. He said that there was a higher chance of accidents due to smartphones was 2,300%. I was crossing one of the pedestrian, pedestrian crossings on Schumann, and the cars stopping both ways, both of them were literally glued to the phone while stopping, and then sort of looked at me with great, oh, yes, do go by. And I was like, oh. So uh, it was right there in my face, both sides, just here, and um, yeah. Yeah. Oh. so I was thinking, right, they need to come to this conference, clearly. So we're back. Hello, virtual audience. I hope you're still with us. I hope you also have been having a good afternoon. Uh, anybody tweet? Yeah, I think there was again a quote from, uh, from the doctor, the quote about uh, the Google car stopping and crying in Amsterdam. I think that was repeated, tweeted, if that is quite a lot of times. I think that is proven to be the quote of the day thus far. Um, this isn't the easiest slot either. You sort of went through the very tough slot, but as you know, on a normal office day, four o'clock is a killer, and you actually do want to reach for the chocolate. And we're not going to reach for the chocolate to give ourselves a reboot. We're going to reach from, uh, for somebody from the European Commission. Where is that person from the European Commission, DG Connect? Yeah. 
Oh, there. Oh, right. Were well, you just looking at me? And I was just totally like that. Well, we actually we are going to reach for you, Roberto Viola. Could you give a very, very warm welcome, please, to the Director General of DG Connect? We're very delighted to have you to complete this <laughs> panoply of DGs. So nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So, thank you. You have a microphone. It is yours. Would you like me to get off the stage or stay with you? Oh, stay with me. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, thank you very much for introducing me. Good afternoon to everybody. So, I see that the subject is uh, really uh, something important. And being uh, at four o'clock, you don't need an introduction how this is important for our society, how this is going to change the way we live. How it's going to save lives because computers, even if they look at smartphones, they can do it in multitasking, and computers don't drink and don't normally take drugs. So uh, it's much, much safer to use automated or assisted driving in foggy highways and enjoy in the sun to drive the car. So this is important for the users, this is important for the society and of course for the industry, and I'm sure you are here for all these reasons. You heard uh, this morning uh, Commissioner Bulch, Commissioner Moedas, uh, and I want to uh, explain to you how the DG Connect and uh, Vice President Ansip uh, and before Commissioner Ottega fit in this teamwork, this team effort uh, that we are trying to do to make this connected and automated driving a reality in Europe as fast as possible. So DG Connect is responsible in the Commission for all the horizontal uh, uh, digital issues for the digital single market. And of course, this is all about data exchanges. It's responsible for cybersecurity. Uh, it's responsible for the technology, so for artificial intelligence, uh, for the uh, connectivity. So, of course, uh, we are spot on with our colleagues to make this a reality. The work we have been doing last year basically concentrated to get the three streams together. So, the first, a very important point, is to get industry organized. That's why we actually organized a round table where both the automotive industry and the telecom industry participated. And as a result of the round table, uh, they created an association presenting to us a project uh, to work together and to start really groundwork, concrete work in this area. Then the other element uh, uh, is to clarify the regulatory environment. And in January, we presented the a communication, which is called the data economy communication, where basically we explained what we want to do about uh, data sharing, liability in, uh, art in artificial intelligence, for instance, uh, portability of data, and now uh, is going to be regulated the way a private companies exchange data and exchange data with the public entities. Uh, and we said very clearly uh, we want to go progressively. You know, there's an open public consultation on this. Uh, and we are going to use connected and automated driving as one of the major pilots to understand better, together with the actors, uh, uh, what to do. So not to rush into regulation, not to rush too quickly, but to use real-life experiment, uh, uh, operational scenario to understand what we need to do in terms of the future regulatory steps. And then the most important point uh, was to work together in Europe. Uh, because of course you cannot do uh, a serious job in terms of uh, having a massive deployment of connected automatic driving in Europe uh, from uh, the desks here in Brussels. Uh, you need to be joined up, not only inside the Commission, but also to work together with the member states. And that's very important. So uh, we decided uh, just uh, two days before the uh, commitment, the renewed commitment, all the political leaders in Rome uh, celebrating the 60th year of the treaty, to convey a meeting with the member states, and we proposed uh, 
a letter of intent. We propose a letter of intent of working to work together with us, to work all together uh, to realize what we call corridors, so cross-border cross connected corridors where on real life scenario, we can experiment connected and automated driving. So my team said uh, maybe uh, we get member states engaged at the level of nine, 10, and the letter of intent actually said in draft, uh, those that will sign the letter of intent, uh, we try to convince the others to sign. You know what has been the result. The result has been that 27 member states signed plus Norway and Switzerland. And here is the letter of intent with all the signatures of the ministers. I find it this an extraordinary result because it gives a very clear political signal that Europe, the member states, the commission, we want to work together to make it happen. So industry already gave a very clear signal by uh, establishing an association to work together. And now on the 23rd of March, the member states, by signing this document, they have given a very clear signal. Uh, we want to work together. We want to make it happen together. And this is really a beautiful result for Europe, uh, which of course, now we intend to honor. So what is going to be the next step? We are going uh, to do whatever is necessary to implement uh, what has been signed here, which means work with the member state and work to establish these famous cross-border corridors. So you know there are already a couple of uh, cross-border corridors between France and Germany, which has been identified, and also along the Danube route, but we want after the signature of, of everyone in Europe uh, to make sure that uh, we identify as many cross-border corridors as possible. And also, we, make, we should make sure that in those cross-border corridors, we work together to establish the standards for data sharing, for actually uh, safety, for actually having very simple things which must be in the same direction. For instance, think about road signs, road sign designed for automated uh, driving. I mean, uh, it's important that what we do, it's as much as standard as possible. Uh, those of you that uh, wrote our white book on the future of Europe, one of the scenarios, it's about the connected car. And the question in the various scenarios we presented about the future of Europe, will this connected car and automated uh, uh, car with autonomous drive work when the borders are crossed? This signature is the answer. Yes, all together we want this to happen. We want to actually work together. So as I said now, it's the time to pass to action. Another point which means passing to action is to have uh, the right frequencies available. And uh, why we need new frequencies? Because of course we have a continuum uh, from the today concept of CITS into the evolution looking at the next uh, uh, mobile system and in particular looking at 5G. 5G, you heard it uh, to, along the day, so I will not repeat what you heard, but of course, gives the answer to many of the technical challenges you are discussing. So in order for 5G to function, we need new frequency bands. And that's exactly, again, what we have committed to work together with the member states. And if Europe succeeds in, for instance, releasing on a mass scale the 3.5 gigahertz band along our highways, we'll be the leading uh, uh, region in the world to do that. So it's complex, but the issue at stake and the price, especially for this, is very high. I finish by saying that, of course, uh, from the European Commission side, uh, we will also engage very seriously in, in this process by facilitating it, by committing to it, and of course, by making available resources, financial resources. And we're looking at resources we have already available. Uh, we will make sure that uh, when it comes to the funding we have for 5G in Horizon 2020, in the coming two years, at least 50 million euros, 5-0, will go uh, towards this objective to develop 
the right 5G technology for these cross-border corridors. We will look again at the, our connected uh, uh, European uh, connected Europe facility to make sure that also more resources are going this, and we will uh, uh, study which legal environment needs to accompany this kind of important commitment. So in a nutshell, uh, we are now at the turning point. Uh, we have created the momentum together with the industry. Now together we have member states, we have created not only the political commitment, uh, but a very concrete road ahead. So I'm sure that the next months to come will be very interesting for you and for us. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, and uh, thank you for, for, for setting the scene so eloquently for our next debate. I just wanted to say, you, I think you actually used the words, a beautiful result for Europe, when you spoke about this letter of intent. You don't really hear words like, a beautiful result for Europe, very much these days. So um, I think that's a very positive, positive statement to put in there. Um, I think we're not staying for questions with you, am I correct? No, well, it's, I mean, uh, that's the question. I is that, shy away. Uh, uh, oh, okay. The audience is big. I mean, the audience is one or two. I mean, you're not obliged, but if you do have, this gentleman is happy to answer. As I said, I know it is the tough slot for you. If not, I have a very simple question. It might... Oh, 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 I love that. That was massive jazz hands there. You're, 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 I can't see you behind. Go for it. Thank you. Yes, sir. It's very pleasing to see four directors general of the commission all working on the same aim. But there's a well-known Chinese proverb, when two ride on a horse, one must ride behind. Which three are riding behind, or putting it more bluntly, who's in charge? But I don't quite understand why you need the one in charge. I mean, all four are in charge, as I tried to explain, because I was kind of anticipating this kind of question. What uh, my DG does uh, is very complementary with what DG Move or DG Grow or DG RTD. Of course, you will not see in DG uh, RTD, for instance, uh, work on the regulation for data sharing. That's a specialty of the house, so to say. We are not participating to the work of the Geneva Convention. That's a work for DG Grow. Uh, the challenge is so big, so important for Europe, uh, that I think four are the bare minimum. But there are other DGs involved. For instance, DG Just. Uh, there are many, many things that imply uh, the work of DG Just. Uh, DG Ener, because of course we are working for intelligent corridors, also looking at electric mobility. So the work is rather gigantic, I must say, because we are talking about transforming the mobility system of Europe. So the more colleagues join, the better it is. Uh, we don't need a particular DG in charge. I think also there was another, I think uh, uh, Commissioner Bultz also spoke this morning about DG Klima. I mean, there was Absolutely. also, and because there was also the comment, I think again, I'm, I'm quoting the same gentleman, uh, Dr. Carlo, who, who, who um, had said, you know, when you look at this, don't just look at this from a societal and economic perspective, but also look at an environmental yeah, no, but, uh, perspective. Uh, absolutely. So, absolutely. And uh, you have so, seen uh, all the DGs, the Commissioner, are very relaxed about this. Uh, they mm -hmm. told you very clearly it's a joint effort. It's a joint uh, effort. Yeah. And the new structure of the Commission with the Vice Presidents, it's actually helping to get uh, the teamwork together. So basically the answer is they're all on the horse and they're all swapping first place and nobody's falling off, okay, and everybody's driving. <laughs> so, and there's all sorts of interesting things it's in the... It's automated driving. Yeah, it's automated driving and every, lots of interesting things in the saddlebags. Okay, is there one more question for this... Gen yes, the gentleman here, thank you. Hello, um, Roberto Baldessari from NEC. Um, autonomous driving needs artificial intelligence as much as it needs 5G communication. Now, what's the funding ratio between artificial intelligence and 5G in Horizon 2020? Thank you. Well, more or less, it's more or less one-to-one -one because the big uh, PPP we have in robotics is run about 300 million euros, and the 5G, it's uh, I'm, I, funding from the commission, then there's the matching fund from industry, it's run about 400. So they are more or less at the same order of magnitude. 
and I have a, a full D directorate, which is a digital industry, which we, we, in which I have a unit, which is on it, uh, in artificial intelligence, and another director, where you have a unit dedicated uh, to 5G. So more or less also in terms of uh, DG Connect commitment, uh, it's on equal footing. Anybody else? Any ladies in the house? I have a sea of male faces, which is all very nice, but any, <laughs> any, any ladies would like to pose well, a question? Well, I must say my director in charge is the Spina Spano, uh, a lady. And you're about to come up yes. on stage as well, I know, which will be lovely. Any other last comment that you would like to reinforce of what you've said? Well, I'm impressed about uh, your commitment and participation. That shows that it's really, really important and deserves, as I said, the five or seven or eight DGs to come to this stage. It's a very big horse. Yes. That's indeed. what I think the, uh, the outcome is. So could we give a round of applause, please, to this gentleman? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Very Thank nice. You. Thank Thanks. You. Right, so as I said, the scene has been set for the last debate of the day, and the last debate of the day is Digital Technologies Enabling CAD. Uh, they're key enablers, we know this, for the convergence of connectivity and automation in vehicles. And to make it commercially viable, a pan-European digital framework really is needed because it enables connectivity and it enables the safe and secure use of information. Um, so interoperability needs are really at the key of this in order to provide not just secure communication, but something that's really unhampered. So in this session, we will endeavour to explore the current status and the possible future scenarios of CAD. We've been a lot of looking into our crystal balls today and discuss the emerging issues from different stakeholder standpoints. So looking at opportunities, looking at challenges in all of those areas, whether it's seamless connectivity or whether uh, which has come up a lot today, it's consumer acceptance. We've got a nice diverse panel to bring this last discussion to life, so please join me in welcoming first uh, a lady on the panel, yippee, Despina Spanu, uh, the director of DG Connect. Welcome, thank you very much. A warm round of applause for this lady, please. Thank you, you may sit next to me. We also have uh, Nadine Leclerc, Senior Vice President, Global Expertise Management and Member of the Board of Directors at Renault. That is a long and impressive title. Thank you very much. And I'm delighted to have another car manufacturer up here. Hello, nice to meet you. And another lady. Uh, we have Professor Ralph Hertwich, who I met just a moment ago, Head of Automotive Business Group here. Nice to see you. Warm round of applause for this gentleman. Thank you. You strolled up there as though you were coming for an Oscar. I love that. That was a very nice move. And finally, from Proximus, thank you. Good, because you can lower my phone bill. No, I'm joking. Matteo Gatta, Director of Tech Strategy and Innovation. Very nice to see you. Very nice to see you too. But you'd like to have a chair. Have my chair. Go on, sit in my chair. I'm good. Sit in my sure. chair. Yes, of course. I'm absolutely fine. So, I think I'm going to turn to you first. Uh, Despina, you've been in um, the Commission for some time. It's quite a new position, this, for you. I think you're going to... Is that correct? Have I got, been given correct information there? And uh, I'm going to let you kick things off. Ladies first, please. And then I'm going to hear from our three uh, speakers. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're moderating really very elegantly. Uh, hello everyone. So I'm Despina Spanu. Yes, I'm rather new in this, not new in the Commission. And I'm one um, living proof that indeed you need a lot of uh, drivers of this horse. I used to be until six weeks ago in the Director General for Justice and Consumers, where indeed, as Mr. Viola just mentioned, there are a lot of elements that come into play in what we're discussing today. Not least uh, areas like data protection, but also consumer trust and consumer acceptance. So I'd like to bring some of this uh, with me today in what I will share with you, and I only have three minutes, I understand. I think you've got about five. I think oh, they argued you. the case for you That's to have a few good. more, so you're good. But also some of the experience uh, I had because I had the privilege to attend uh, this fantastic event that we had put the picture of uh, during Mr. Viola's uh, intervention, uh, the signature of this letter of intent, where indeed uh, 29 European countries put their signature in uh, deploying what uh, you have all been doing, because I know a lot of people in this room are behind what is actually happening. This is not the future, this is the present. And uh, we saw a commitment that I think is unprecedented at the political level. 
and we now feel, um, uh, I won't say the pressure, the pressure, but the encouragement to move forward because we have been asked to help uh, all those member states to work on deploying these large uh, tests and demonstrations uh, and to work, excuse me, on data quality and liability, on connectivity, on data access, on road safety. And this inspires me to just share with you three thoughts uh, that govern our work because you have heard a lot about the technology, you've heard a lot about the technical aspects of this work also from my colleagues in the Commission and will continue tomorrow. But the way I see it, there are three areas where digital technologies are fundamental for us to do this right. And the first area is, of course, connectivity. Indeed, uh, as Mr. Viola said, you have heard a lot about 5G, but we need connectivity um, to unroll all the benefits of road safety, sustainability, mobility efficiency that connected and autonomous cars can bring. And there, what we as the European Commission intend to do is to try and make uh, connected and automated mobility one of the lead sectors for the rollout of 5G, because 5G is the, the, the fundamental piece in this puzzle. And for that, we need um, uh, spectrum availability, geographical coverage, and of course, cross-border corridors that are uninterrupted. And there, the letter of intent brings the political commitment that this can happen, so we have to use technology to make that happen. So this is where we are today. And of course, we need to work on the complementarity of 5G with the other technologies because we need to make sure that the system is seamless. The second area where digital technologies must help is security. Uh, I've heard uh, during this morning session a lot um, the importance of cybersecurity. Um, one of the areas when we speak to the civil society about connected items, uh, be that cars or the Internet of Things, and I watched with a lot of interest what was being discussed earlier, and you spoke about consumer acceptance, is exactly this fear of connectivity when it comes to security. Right now in the Commission, we are working on cybersecurity, and I believe that in the area of connected and automated cars, we have really an opportunity to make sure that the systems, the technologies integrate security to make them safer also from that perspective, not just on the road, but also uh, in the way they behave as connected items. I think they can become an example and a best uh, practice. And um, I have heard a lot about the, the area of certification. It is definitely something we are looking at and uh, where we may be testing very soon uh, your views as to what we should be doing in the future because it has to be covered um, for security to be uh, ensured. If we want these cars to be better, they need to be smarter, and the way to be smarter is to be more secure. The last area I want to address is trust. We spoke a lot about data, and uh, it was quite um, courageous, I would say, for the political masters who signed this letter of intent to speak about the importance of now seeing how we ensure data access, data quality, and liability. And if we want to have a system that will be trusted by all, be that the industry or the people, we need a good system where privacy is made by design and where the legal framework on consent is built in to enable data to feel secure from the point of view of the user, but also to be available to unleash this fantastic economy that we can have unleashed with the data that can come out. I heard this incredible number of, I don't know how many hundreds of gigabytes per hour that is produced by uh, a car of this technology. And, and for that to happen, we really need to get it right, because uh, this is an area where, as you know, it's not just the laws that are challenging it is also the uptake from the people at the same time the potential for the economy is enormous the potential for the safety is enormous and the applications of the data in other areas of the economy are also uh, so big that we have to get it right last but not least liability in Europe we tend to have um, difficulties when we talk about liability laws because we bumped into national systems and we need to avoid the fragmentation if we're going to have cars moving from one country to the other. This is uh, the fundamental difference between Europe and other parts of the world. The reason why we think this letter of intent is so pioneering is that it is the first time you have political masters of 29 different countries, even if they're neighboring, it is not so obvious, that agree to open their borders to test uh, these new technology. technology. So 
they mean by that that they're also willing to open their laws. And I think this is a fantastic opportunity we have because unless we have one single liability system that is also enabled by the technology so that it can create modern laws, flexible laws, future-proof laws, this will be impossible uh, for the technology to be unleashed. And I hope that with that, we can kick off the discussion. Thank you. Thank you for your clarity. Thank you. It's very comprehensive. I'm going to go to the lady at the far end now, Nadine Leclerc, um, if you'd like to kick us off. You've got about seven minutes. I hope that's more or less what you were advised. Oh, no, you're looking. Oh, uh, yeah, well, they're all right. Know, they're OK. Know, you're, you're, the you're, well, the let's, put, let's put it this way. This panel stands between all these good people, fresh air and auto world. So hmm. okay. seven, eight I'll minutes, try. we're good. I Thank you. Try, try your best. I will try to keep I won't be cross. Thank okay. you. OK, so my name is Nadine Leclerc. I am from Renault, and I am managing the network expertise within the company. Uh, today, I will introduce, in fact, the view of uh, Renault and the alliance, of course, uh, regarding the status of the scenarios that are leading uh, with uh, autonomous uh, car and connected car, first of all, connected car. Uh, in fact, uh, the scope of the big system we have to address is made of three technical key areas. The car, the connectivity system, the back end linked to IoT to, compete, to complete the complete scope of what we call the extended vehicle. When we are talking about connected cars, it is three. When we are talking about driving, we move to four because we need also uh, the infrastructure. Features or use cases are depending on the technical performance of each area uh, and the global system to be, has to be compliant with, we said already that, privacy, security, safety, when we are talking about driving. All this environment is moving very fast. The car manufacturer liability covers extended vehicle perimeter from the car feature to the back end and this is why we need our platform connected car. And I wanted to insist a bit on this key point that we have uh, as OEM, all OEM to implement. Basic function of the platform are a low communication with, of the connected car with external communication networks and protocols, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, cellular, DRCRC, G5, 5G in the future. This is a connected ITS sphere. We have also to provide to the system of the car and to the platform of services functions of management and treatments of vehicle data. We have also, in this platform, to contribute to an operational update of the car by monitoring and supervising software uh, update over the air. Of course, this type of platform is following objectives driven by scalability and adaptation to the environment. From a technical point of view, we need to be able to create new services during the life cycle of the car without knowing the diversity of the cars, their EE architecture, protocol of messages, embarked TCU or software, or the external communication, nor the regulation to follow or service providers. And we have also to guarantee operational performance, availability, storage capacity, also treatments, communication, maintenance. As a consequence, this platform has a cycle time different from the car, even if it is composed of elements in and out of the car, but plug with. It is an additional brick we add in our systems. Different ty cycle time, also due to privacy rules embarked in the regulation. Cyber, not yet, but should come fast as a regulation. And the most intrusive uh, and impacting one is the safety, and it is progressing also. Regarding the feature of connected cars, 
state of the art seems the most advanced. Most of the Lego techno bricks exist for infotainment, for OTA, for navigation, for systems that can run with current LTE, but, but where we have to implement privacy rules, privacy rules and adapt all along the flow of data, the relevant cyber when crossing a border or roaming with other uh, providers of telecommunication. Technolo connectivity technologies, LTE, G5, 5G, Wi-Fi, NFC, RFD, and so on, are key then to enhance the scope of use cases from connected services to driving. We all know the limits of speed, density, latency, and liability. Car features or use cases will be different depending on of those characteristics. To run faster for safety, we could go to hybrid communication before future enhancement generation are coming because as far as the car itself cannot see or foresee its environment to make safe driving decision, the car needs the infrastructure and or its neighbors. It is CITS uh, environment. More generally, the performance at one moment of the extended vehicle is the mix of every player performance car features. Connectivity provided by operators, infrastructure, deployment, cloud services efficiency under constraints of privacy, security, safety, always the same. That's why experimentation uh, is so important uh, to be able to test all those corridors, using those corridors, all the features we want to implement in the street for our customers. This is the reason why I think that we have a real asset in putting in common all the use cases we develop locally and settle standards in order to deploy all the new features in industry at the same time, at the good level of cost, because mass effect is tremendously mandatory, to make it affordable for all, including high level of safety, which is for us mandatory. Thank you for attention. Hi. Yes, it was less than seven minutes. <laughs> oh my God, I'm... I'm <laughs> Très bien. Très bien. Etoile Doré. That was very, very, uh, very, very excellent. Um, can I just ask a favour? I'm just going to take one second to bring a chair up here because I feel like it's, I feel like it's rather looming, and I don't want to feel looming over over these good people. Thank you so much. That's great. Now I can sort of feel part of the crowd rather than, I don't know, somebody a bit scary at the end because I, I scared this lady and I didn't mean to. Okay, thank you very much for setting us off there. So, for starting us off, uh, Ralph Hurtvich. Yeah, otherwise we could have traded places, actually. I was about to offer you that, oh, but now no, it's off in a different way. I'm anyway, good. Thank um, you. Anyway, glad to see such a, uh, such a full room here um, this late of the day. Um, we heard about the vehicle, we're going to hear about connectivity, let's hear about the back end. Um, about exactly half a year ago, I quit my former job, which was head of vehicle automation at Daimler, uh, to join here. So I moved from the edge to the cloud. Um, that gives you some indication of where I think the real challenges, or at least for the time being, the more interesting challenges in vehicle automation are. Because I've come to believe that what we see in vehicle automation is going to mimic pretty much what we've seen in the PC space. When PCs came up, all the intelligence was on the PC locally. And once they were connected, that intelligence moved into the network. And I've come to believe that we'll see the same thing happening with automated vehicles when they're connected. Right now, we focus very much on getting those vehicles done and having them autonomously create uh, a reconstruction of their environment. Uh, and a lot of that could be aided by linking them together, connecting them to the backbone, and sharing information between them. And much of that information is location-based. And for us at here, of course, that means it comes as a map. Um, now, you may say, 
map? Well, isn't that the thing that is actually sitting very much on the edge in the car in my navigation system? Well, that may be the case today. That's certainly not how we see the map going forward. And this is why we believe it's such an essential element of connecting everything together. So looking at the vehicle and the information that the map can deliver, or any information that refers to location, of course, gives the automated vehicle a sense of where it is, where it has to go to, and how it gets there. That's pretty much the same for you if you use a navigation system. What gets really interesting with automated vehicles is that the map can be so much more. The map can give the vehicle some anticipation of what is around it like preparing it for certain traffic lights to look at, like indicating different difficult stretches of the road, uh, perhaps an intersection where typically pedestrians come from the left, so it's worth looking out for those. It can also uh, give the vehicle some information of what others, other drivers or other vehicles did on a certain stretch of road. And one thing, that working for years on automated vehicles, I learned comes in pretty handy, is if you let those vehicles learn what human drivers would do. It was said before, yes, we're aiming at safer traffic, but it's not that we are all terrible drivers. Actually, on statistical average, we're pretty good drivers. So if we can feed that knowledge and that wisdom through some learning algorithm into those vehicles, those vehicles would actually do a pretty good job of driving. And that could all come from a map. Of course, not the traditional map that we have today. That map today is essentially for human consumption. It is updated every once in a while. And it is cartographed using very, very special vehicles. So it's a very tedious process, sometimes involving human editing. Now, going forward, those maps are automatically generated they're mostly for machine consumption, and they're up to date in real time. So they're collected by the vehicles out there and are fed into the map. And this is what we're building. We're building that closed loop where we take data that vehicles on the road recognize, process that so that it becomes a map, aggregate that data, and feed it back as knowledge to automated vehicles. And we tie in as much data as possible from the various OEM clouds that we can get access to. Because this is a network product. This is a platform. And also, sometimes we Europeans are a bit scared of platforms. A platform is all about scale. So the more users you have on a platform, the more valuable the platform is. Now, the problem with that loop is it's very difficult to start that because, I mean, if an automated vehicle needs to have that and you want to build the first automated vehicle, where does the map come from? So we have to seed that process. And the good thing is we have those methods available. You can see that little vehicle on the side, which is one of our collection vehicles that we're upgrading to collect maps in high resolution because when it comes to machine-readable maps, it is not longer about roads, it's about lanes, it's about individual segments of that lane. It's about 20 centimeter accuracy rather than a few meters of accuracy. So we are doing this, we're jump-starting this process, and this is going to be available in the years to come. What do we need as a framework for all of this? And I'm sure we're going to hear more about this in a minute. Um, of course, we need connectivity. Um, I mean, just working on autonomous vehicles, I tended to say uh, when asked for what is the most important technology that I would need, um, my answer typically was, well, some white paint on the road would be very helpful because that would give the vehicle a lot of orientation. But now looking into this cloud aspect, I think connectivity, reliably, pervasive, with guaranteed quality, is something that we all look forward to. Um, privacy and security, we've heard being mentioned. 
many times today, and I think it's very important because it's the prerequisite of making this all work. Without privacy, this will not be used. And I think, again, coming from a European perspective, I think we take a special look at that, uh, and it has to be ingrained in everything. But we have to be very open and also embrace new technologies for privacy. Privacy by design, privacy as a service was already mentioned. Because it is very difficult to assume that you go through some written and explicit consent mode for every and each of these communication pairs that you have in this Internet of Things. And finally, Privacy is sort of the stepping stone. You have to have that, otherwise things will not be used. But it will all be about making attractive offers where people realize that they get th something for giving data into such a network. And we've seen a couple of examples before on safety, on mobility. It all comes with connected and automated vehicles. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Proximus. <laughs> Mr. Proximus, the floor is yours to round up these, uh, these speakers and then we can move into some discussion. Thank you. First of all, good afternoon and thanks for inviting me out. Is he on? Hang on a minute. We had a bit of this this morning. Hold it very close. Try again. Hello. Oh, there you go. Can you hear me? Very good. Good afternoon and very happy to be here and thanks for inviting us. So Proximus is uh, uh, the largest telecom operator in Belgium. Uh, you might have heard of us because of a number of announcements we made in the past months and specifically so also our, uh, our uh, ambition to uh, definitely to deploy fiber, which is a step towards uh, also mobile densification, so adding, adding the pervasive connectivity. But I shall come back to that point in a minute. I prepared a couple of slides uh, to, uh, I was asked to look at the technologies that are present today from a connectivity angle. Eh? Uh, and what those technology can, can do, it can help definitely. I would say the building blocks are definitely there. Um, so, uh, as a Proximus, we, we, we want to constantly lead, besides the announcement on, uh, on fiber, we also have been uh, demonstrating 4.5G already about a year ago, and also demonstrating 5G about before, in November last year. We will continue to, uh, to, to stay ahead of the curve, certainly. Um, we, uh, we very much look forward to, uh, to, the, to the coming years, I would say, because 2019-2020, they are close enough. But we also look forward to announce the, the potential of the LTE networks and the roadmaps going forward. So uh, we are building, I would say, the present because automotive for telcos is an opportunity that is there today. And as many more cars are getting connected, leveraging the strong coverage and the fastest uh, 4G, where latency has already come down to a, a very attractive point and will continue to improve going forward. And meanwhile, we look forward to the, uh, to the 5G generation, but the step towards there, I always repeat it, is mobile densification. So having possibility to add uh, radiation point, especially in cities, to announce uh, the, the experience uh, for many use cases, so not only automotive, but for automotive to offer a, a platform of connectivity, especially in cities, to help them to discover the environment. Um, so uh, I don't want to run through this. I think so names are very much uh, uh, known to you. I want just to pick a couple of them. Sp I spoke already about latency. The other element which is important is the ability to make more dynamic uh, uh, the, so the EUICCs, which means you know the uh, the next generation uh, SIM. So the SIM module is, uh, has been strong in uh, in uh, in uh, in the GSMN area with this. Technology. We are also helping. We're making uh, the system more performant from an efficiency perspective, also from a process perspective. 
Also, uh, we shall be looking at, and we do not, we observe very much the industry, the automotive in a, in a very strong transformative area. Also, we see new business model coming in. And uh, we see uh, a, a, a nexus between those new business models, like car sharings, so diff very different view of younger generation vis-a-vis -vis cars. So we see that as a, a very interesting fit, also uh, for, uh, for when it comes to our own value proposition. So looking forward, looking you know, to a, the, the major milestone which is ahead of the industry, automotive, so the, the, uh, getting to the highest level of autonomous driving, we also understand that there, is a, uh, there are today building blocks available, there is a strong investment in uh, artificial intelligence technology, there is a request for pervasive connectivity. Uh, uh, the, the colleagues that have spoken before me, they've spoken about complementarity. I don't want to end up in a technology sterile discussion. What matters to me is that telecom is a standardized scale uh, platform. And uh, as I said, there will be uh, drivers that will bring uh, that connectivity that to enhance the existing connectivity going forward, so there will be certainly synergies, opportunity when it comes to the infrastructure, so the vehicle to infrastructure uh, um, exchange of information, which can be also whether to feed maps, also to bring additional information to the drivers and to see beyond the traditional, well, beyond the, the, the modules which, which pertains to an automotive, uh, autonomous driving today. So uh, for us, it's important, of course, that the, uh, as a telco, uh, we know how important it is to uh, data. And we, start, we discover that to optimize our processes, to, to enhance our customer experience. Uh, today already uh, within us, we, we look at investment very much on the basis of uh, analytics. Uh, and we do operational decisions on the basis of analytics. So how important is data? So for us, as a Proximus, we also invested uh, we, uh, in the applications for automotive. Uh, we are a majority shareholder of a company called B-Mobile, which offers uh, platforms to, to improve uh, the, uh, the city planning, to enhance the, the traffic and to remove bottleneck in cities. Those type of uh, companies, they do depend upon developability of information. And today it's important that, that at the application level, we make sure the value uh, stays in European clouds if possible. And so, uh, last, last word is, as uh, I said, I will not end up in a discussion on uh, technology, which technology is better. I think the industry, the two industries have already started working together. That is great. We need to have, I would say, synchronized R&D cycles, 5G specs, can still be announced, and I think the, the telco and automotive are today working together in several associations to walk the path together. To, this is good, it's good for automotive, it's good also for telco, because enhanced visibility on returns going forward as we invest. Thank you. You may hang on to that. I've got one. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Round of applause. Thank you. Just coming from sort of outside the industry, I love this phrase, pervasive connectivity. It sounds like something you might go to a doctor for. Oh, I don't Oh, you've got pervasive connectivity. I don't know. That's the little bit the way my brain works coming from outside this. So we have about 10 minutes. It's the end of the day. Do you have the energy with these great brains here? Oh, you do. You're a star. Hello. Hello. Uh, Andrei Son from uh, Continental Automotive Romania, Country Innovation Manager. I would really love to thank you for this great horizontal representation of the market. Uh, if we had also a first year supplier, it would be complete. Um, I would like to ask a horizontal question. We discussed a lot about technology today, but um, I heard very little about the business behind. So I would like to understand your point of view from each of you related to the ownership of essential data that enables connected automated driving and about the usage of this data in order to make profit in the future. So what's your point of view related to this very important technology Ralph, in Europe? And would it, would it be a profit-oriented business or it would be, I don't know, a collaborative uh, Europe strategic activity? 
let me let me take a start at this. Um, I mean, the data is only the beginning, and the data, uh, I mean, has a certain value. So whoever brings that data, I guess, is either entitled uh, to some money for it or through some service that is built upon that. Uh, and uh, another source of money or another element in the monetization is the analytics, what you do with the data. And I think that, at least for us, that is where uh, where our value contribution comes from, uh, that we take that information and make that available. Like if, if we learn something from the behavioral patterns of the vehicles and feed that back as intelligence to the vehicle, or if we, as we already do today, collect traffic on the road uh, from vehicle probes, that constitutes a certain value. And these are the kinds of monetizations that you're going to see. Data goes in. Analytics is performed, data comes back, and that has a higher value uh, than the original data. So in fact, uh, I think that uh, what we have to keep in mind is that uh, data is valuable as far as the benefit is coming back to the customer. Uh, and uh, if we are talking about data, for OEM is very useful when you are able to diagnostic better or quicker the car when you are able to monitor uh, the parts within the car, be able to, uh, in fact, uh, explain uh, how it could last more or better uh, performance you can uh, deliver. So this is very valuable for the customer. Uh, I think that uh, saying that we have to make business with it is not the right uh, way to, to, to address that. I think that uh, as a mobility actor, we must keep within the value chain and uh, uh, not being squeezed by the data and putting out of the business. Uh, what is important is to get in the business because it is our. <laughs> so, uh, but data could be very important, in fact, to make more precise, to answer more precisely to the needs of the customer. Currently, we have, I can say, only one way to answer to the customer, which is a passenger car or something and in fact, you use your car. So now we are more and more uh, going to uh, a combination of usage, as it has been uh, explained. It could be a sort of, we announce, in fact, the usage of the car, but we could also use the car as a mobility, as a service. Not, and the, the, same peop, the same person could use mobility one part of the day as a mobility, or another part of the day, uh, enjoying what is uh, provided in the car using connectivities and data. And I think that as far as it is valuable, of course, it must be uh, going, it must go back to the customer. Thank you, that's very clear. Uh, yes, Matteo. I would like to start from exactly that. So the value needs to go back to the, uh, the customers. Uh, it's important. My only suggestion is to, uh, to look at the purpose of accessing data. And there is one probably, uh, if, if we look at cities, eh, the urban area, which are the most challenging really to, uh, to uh, but also are the, probably the, the beneficiary of, of the outcome, of the positive outcome, I think we should also be looking at those use cases uh, and, and try to understand what is the business model in, in that environment. What matters is that um, what matters is that there should be the right balance when it comes to any type of approach, any type of regulatory uh, regulation approach. On that, we need to keep a business mind where, when and try to enhance innovation, try to be pragmatic when it comes to data, not build barriers. And if there are barriers, whether there are uh, linked to uh, uh, competitive dynamics, they need to be addressed. But I think it's important that we keep a business innovation mind when it comes to data, because eventually is that the data that feed uh, applications, the applications are those that announce the customer experience. I mean, I'm not speaking from the business perspective, obviously. But um, I think that uh, what we hear now is that everybody agrees on who owns the data and that we need to uh, have a very balanced system that takes into account everybody in the equation, including the customer and um, the public sector interest, the viability of the business model. So everything needs to be taken into account. The laws that are in place make that possible. 
they come into place, in fact, now when the business models are unrolling, so it's very good timing. I think what we need to work together is to create these models by which the owner of the data also has control of the data. And I think that will allow also the owner to be more uh, interested in leaving the data and uh, making it available. And we now see also business models being developed for this kind of systems. So people who will come in this business equation and will offer particular systems by which you also get something in return. And we also see that the civil society, interestingly, now is opening up when it comes to this kind of system. So taking control, being rewarded for the use of the data, and, and this is the part of the consumer uptake that we were talking about earlier. I'd like to take if there is one. Yeah. Oh, that's a very subtle. One more question from the floor. It, does, it doesn't have to be to everybody, because I'm going to ask a last question, which is a bit broader to all of them. But yes, the gentleman here. Hello. Uh, yes, Steve Phillips, Conference of European Directors of Roads. Um, I hope I'm not going to come across as one of the Luddites that Commissioner Moidas was referring to or appeared to be referring to this morning. But we've had a lot of presentations today uh, from industry. Uh, and I, when I read the, the, the description of this session, it talks about the potential for improving safety, improving efficiency, improving reducing congestion, environment, et cetera, et cetera. And it talks a lot about potential. And um, we've heard a lot about 5G. My, my, my question is, because we haven't had any public authorities uh, on the platform that I'm aware of yet, I'm, I'm interested in where the panel actually sees the real benefits now of corporate automated driving. Because we hear a lot about the importance for industry. Again, Mr. Moidas this morning talked about the importance of Europe being first. My basic question is, is it really, really important to be first? Or is it important to get it right and to get it at the right time? No, 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 that's a good thing. Okay, so who wants to uh, lead on that? Despina, is that something you'd like to, or would, should we keep the same? Sorry? Okay, okay, you, wow, you are polite. This is in our lovely living room. You are, Ralph, why don't you start us off? I think we've we've heard um, the various uh, or um, objectives that are uh, pursued by automated cars. Um, safety being one, comfort certainly being another, uh, and uh, sort of introducing new or enabling new mobility schemes uh, yet another. Personally, um, I think there is a lot to be gained, especially on that last segment, uh, because we've seen it before. Um, new city models could could derive from that fact using mobility in a different way uh, so that this entire mode of transportation really gets changed. Um, and that is, I think, what we should all be looking out for, and especially from a European research perspective, um, I think we need to look um, beyond the Google car, because many people say, well, the Google car is the future, it's not. It's the present. We have to look beyond that. Yeah, just hold it very close, just okay. right up there, because then they can better hear you at the back. Thank you. Just right up, literally. You need to almost eat the microphone, I'm afraid. Thank you. I think... I will try not to eat it. I think the answer is obvious. Uh, obviously, when we get it right, but... Uh, that's what we are trying to do. And in fact, this conference is, is part of that. Uh, the technology is there, and when it is not, it is coming. Uh, the political commitment is there. Um, the cars are there. So uh, we are ready. It is about making the right moves now and putting the whole picture together. So uh, it's not just about being leaders. I think what my political... Uh, uh, hierarchy was talking about is the fact that there is an opportunity for Europe because a lot of what is happening does happen in Europe and Europe has put that at the forefront of its work uh, but we are doing this not because we want to be leaders but because we happen to already be leading and I think we are also leading on the regulatory side uh, when we talk about all the data issues look at the um, communication we made earlier 
this year on the data economy, where we're trying to figure out how we will unleash this economy that has enormous potential. And if we use this technology right on connected and automated mobility, uh, we can unleash this economy further. Uh, not to mention the societal um, uh, benefits that we are gaining out of this, not only when it comes to safety, but giving access to people that today don't have access, either because of where they live or because of personal mobility issues, uh, the intermodal the system we're going to create through this technology. So I, I think I agree fully with the previous speaker that this technology is there, this is happening now, and we're trying to get it right. Okay, does anyone want to add? Yes, Matteo. Perhaps a short. Uh, I would say I think the uh, interesting questions, you know, whether you want to lead or you want to get it right. I would leave the answer to the automotive se sector, to as far as uh, telecom, as far as telco are concerned. Of course, I mean, uh, we uh, depends on your market position, but certainly when it comes to uh, bringing the elements to to support the automotive industry transformation. As I said before, a journey is a journey that we do together. And what is important at, at present is to capture the opportunity of today, so to connect cars, but also to be di directionally right for the investment uh, in the future. So get it right, get it directionally right for the future now, prepare the future. That is important for us. For the rest, I think the, the, un the best answer can be given by the automotive sector. <laughs> look, look how well we okay. are connected, just to get the microphone yeah. to you. Okay. Beautifully done. I, I think that uh, related to uh, what is the best moment, in fact, uh, we are progressing uh, day after day. What we can say is that from uh, two of us uh, each, we bring uh, already a lot. For example, navigation. I think that navigation is already in the street and it brings a lot, even if it is not always with connected car could be uh, through the cell phone, and it is very, uh, very helpful, I think, for uh, saving some time for all the people or CO2. Uh, related to uh, ADAS, for example, uh, in fact, it is not connected ADAS, but uh, we enhance uh, by far the safety using putting ADAS on our cars with sensors, some intelligent artificial already uh, in order to break uh, at the right uh, moment. What is at stake here is more uh, to be sure that uh, within the global ecosystem we are able together to provide uh, to mass uh, customers uh, and massive uh, number of customers all those uh, features. Uh, and uh, to do that, that's why we need to do it together. We need uh, to lead to cost which is the lowest as possible in order to equip maximum cars as possible using uh, the connectivity to be sure that we can provide either navigation, either ADAS connected, either also uh, traffic light connection in order to avoid CO2 and start and stop at each. So I think that it is now really a, a question of testing together to be to dispatch all those features in a massive way. Okay, ladies and thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to park audience questions because I hope some of you may be at the next venue. I'm yes. yes, good. Okay, so there will be an opportunity. And I do want to ask one last question for some for a really concise answer and sort of to build off the back of the one from this gentleman. So what I'm hearing is you're saying, well we're getting it right, there's this in place, there's that in place, and quite frankly, there isn't going to be any kind of acceleration unless there is this in place. Um, and we need to get the legal and we need to get the regulatory and so on frameworks correct so that we get this good direction. Interestingly, let's say there isn't a race, but looking forward to tomorrow when we're going to have a session on sort of the international element, international cooperation, each of you, in a real nutshell, what would you see as the main strengths, perhaps the, the risks, the opportunities for Europe? And I mean really in a nutshell, where does Europe sit in all of this? What is, what is special about Europe? Where are the difficulties? Where is Europe positioned, in your view, currently? Just to end on that question, who would like to start off on that? Yes, you should, because you're from the European Commission. You can go first this time. Naturally. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Well, I think uh, I will go back to, the, to what started this afternoon's session, that in Europe there is um, an industry commitment, which we have seen through the various formations of uh, all the industries that have come together, be that the automotive, but also the telecoms industry, uh, in, um, in moving forward. But most of all, we also now have a political commitment for cars to be moving across 29 countries, and this is marking a real difference uh, compared to the rest of the world, where you will have sovereign countries with um, borders beyond the internal market, but actual borders that have decided that this uh, technology is beyond that. And I think that there we're really ahead. It is a challenge, but it is also an opportunity. Matteo. No. Ah, see, I kept you on your toes there. Thank you. So um, I'll give you maybe a short one. So, so as I said before, telecom is standard. Uh, so it's based on standards, and it is a scale business. Yeah? Mobile network have, an import, have been there for, for years, and they, they prove to deliver uh, the value. So cellular technologies are technologies with a clear uh, high visibility roadmap and an history of fulfilling customer needs. So we do, uh, we do see that as a strength. Europe has been the cradle of uh, cellular technology in the past generation, not the 4G, unfortunately, but we're catching up. So I think we invite the automotive to leverage that, uh, not to create systems uh, uh, that are uh, duplicated, and this can be done with a very strong collaboration since the start. It's my message that I repeated already twice. I do apologize for that, but it's really key. And so I think it's important that, uh, that the automotive takes advantage of this uh, stream of innovations and visibility on the roadmaps. And uh, if not, OK, uh, if not, if we, uh, if we want to rebuild systems or rebuild logic, uh, or rebuild additional networks uh, without synergizing, well, you know, the, there will be lower willingness to invest, uh, duplication of efforts. And most likely, there will not be scale in, in the sense that is needed, in the measure that is needed for really uh, automated driving. Okay. Okay, and Europe sits well with this synergy, with getting everybody to work together, in your view. Right, what do you think? I mean, literally, in a, really, in a brief nutshell, the strengths, the obstacles, where, where is Europe sitting in all of this? What can we be pleased about? What do we need to look out Very for? briefly, I told you much about this is about data. And I think the biggest chance that Europe has is to get data right. Because we care. We care how it's used, and we care who uses it. Thank you. And uh, the lady from Renault. I think that uh, we have to be pragmatic by implementing uh, what uh, exists as soon as it exists in a big scale to get the scale effect. Uh, and moreover, I think that we must be very careful with our willingness to embark also uh, all in regulation. So we must be very careful with what to be standardized and what to be regulated. Otherwise, it could uh, slow down a lot the implementation. Okay, thank you. So thank you to all four of our speakers. Hopefully you'll get a chance to have some one-on-one -on -one time with them in just a moment at the next venue. Please, can you give a very warm round of applause to all four of them? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you may take your seats. I need to just do a couple of tiny bits of housekeeping. Bear with me. Um, lovely audience. Uh, we've reached the end of the day. Well, we've reached, let's say, the technical end of the day because you are um, eagerly uh, urged to make your way to a fabulous venue, which some of you may know, some not, Auto World in the Parc Saint-Contenaire. There you go. Auto world. There is a real clue there in the title, the connection. Partying, as such, begins at half past five and goes on until eight o'clock. So if you are craving fresh air, literally go on foot. It is just a mere 10-minute walk, if that. 
Uh, there's a map in your bags. If you really want to experience the Brussels Metro, then uh, the stop Schumann is outside the building. It's one stop to Merod. And Auto World is literally a two-minute walk in the saint Um There's been some fantastic stuff, but it's right at the end of the day. But I just wanted to say a few of the bits that I picked up on. I think um, there was a big emphasis from the gentleman at the OECD that we need to be socially ready, including at a policy level. There was a very good comment made on new users. We need to think about who those new users in the future will be. And also there was a comment on we need fairness in the market. So we need really broad access to driverless vehicles. So the OEMs, how are they going to keep up? And how do we prevent the digital and the software outstripping the hardware? Privacy by design came up. Privacy as a prerequisite came up a lot. Um, and uh, I think what really came up, obviously, in the data is the added value to the user. That has to be sold, and it has to that user, and it has to be clear. And also, the importance of the exchange of data between car manufacturers themselves, which was the comment from Mr. Volvo. So, uh, thank you all. Let me just say thank you to our speakers for taking the time to be here. Thank you to you for listening and contributing with your questions. Very important, tomorrow is equally content rich, right? And the front end of the day is really is heavier. It's a bit of a switch. We've got four sessions back to back, all right? So drink as much as you like. Just make sure you get good sleep because we kick off at nine on the dot, okay? So you need to be full of energy. Don't forget your badge, all right, and your e-pass. Otherwise, you'll have horrible trouble getting in. And now I really can release you. I wish you a very, very lovely evening. You've got gorgeous sunshine. Take a walk. Enjoy Auto World. Do not try and steal one of those cars because that will be a big problem and there are some serious beauties in there, okay? And on that note, have a very, very good time. See you tomorrow.